So now it's on. So I was at your mercy while we were singing, wasn't I? I am so sorry. I, am so, I was actually sitting near Lee Hastings. So that's who you heard singing real. That wasn't me. So, but I, I just want to say on behalf of our family, thank you. Uh, Don uh, was right about one thing. I don't know how great the impact was. My kids were here, but y'all were certainly a huge impact on them. And I uh, just appreciate you so very, very much. And uh, many of you still keep in touch with my kids. And I'm so very thankful for that. I, I'm just going to have to really stay in touch with Dave Roberts. I think he hears more from my son than I do. And my son now lives with us. Uh, which, with that in mind, if anybody has a job, uh, I've got a son uh, who is looking. And, uh, but no, y'all just were wonderful. And just appreciate you and love you so much. It's, it's one thing for somebody to do something nice for you. And that means a lot. But when somebody does something nice for your kids, that's another level. And, and that's who you are to our family. And so thank you. Thank you so very, very much. All right, I'm going to show my age here, and I think some of you will jump into this category as well. Who here remembers beta tapes? Yeah, a few beta tape folks. All right, yeah. There's a few of us out there remember the beta tape. How about VHS tapes? Can more of you jump into that? Yes, VHS tapes. Uh, do you remember what it was like back in the days of VHS tapes? Where did you go on a Friday night and everybody in town went there? It was Blockbuster Movie Gallery, a video rental store, wasn't it? And if you didn't get there early enough, you missed out on what? The new releases. And there were like 80 of them all in those boxes up there and you wanted to get there early and you would, you'd be looking for the tape behind the box and if it was just the box, that's not what you wanted. And generally if you got there late enough, you couldn't get the movie you wanted so you went and watched, you know, something way old again. You know, let's go watch Indiana Jones again for the 15th time, you know. But then, but then you noticed, especially if you were a continuous and habitual renter, that those tapes had something on them and it was a sticker and that sticker was there because sometimes if you got home with this great movie you got the new release you were so excited you got it home there were those times where you put it in the machine and the end of the movie came up you remember that and you were like whoa who's the goober before me that didn't what rewind the tape so we had to put stickers on all the tapes be kind Rewind. It actually became kind of a big phenomenon. There were t-shirts made, be kind, remind, be kind, remind. Why? Because there's so many obnoxious people in the world that just aren't kind. And if you really want to be kind, just rewind the tape. That's all I'm asking. Fast forward to today. Some of you may have experienced this. It's one of the greatest experiences in the world. You're going through the coffee line. I bet Don's had this happen every now and then. And you're going up there to pay for your $10 cup of coffee, you know. And when you get up there, somebody says, yours was paid for, the guy that just left paid your coffee. <gasps> oh, man, how cool was that? Well, if that happens to you, what do you feel obligated to do? Well, generally pay for the next guy. And you'll say, oh, Scrooge, you know. And you go, oh, I'll get the next guy. And you go, oh, yeah, that's a caravan of 15 kids who are all here. Oh, man. Well, I didn't have to pay 10, but I paid 200. Well, you know, see how that works. But we love those random acts of kindness. Would that be fair? And what we wish was they happen more often. Cheryl and I were uh, at St. Augustine last weekend, and that's kind of our little getaway. We can just get away for the day, and just we run over there, and we've got this little burger joint that we just love. It's called Gas. Now, don't judge it by its name, but it's really a great burger, you know. And we were... Got there, and we knew it'd be a little crowded, so we were ready to wait, and we didn't have to wait too long, but it was very crowded, and it took a while for our burger to get there. Not that long, but you know, you, you just anticipated. It's a Saturday. It's a beautiful day in St. Augustine. It's going to take a while. We're just enjoying the day, and the waiter came up when he brought our burgers to us, and it had only been 15, 20 minutes, not really long at all from our estimation, and the guy goes, I'm sorry this took so long. Dude, we're good. <laughs> Actually, we're just happy to get away. We're enjoying the sunshine. And he goes, oh, thanks. Because not everybody's been like that today. I'm like, what? He goes, oh, I've already had to tell a couple of people just to leave 
because they were just so mad. They had to wait to get a table, and then you got them a drink a little late. And this one guy just started railing into me, and I, I just said, leave. And he goes, I sure wish people were more kind. And when you think about it, kindness is pretty simple. But you really don't see it enough, do you? Wouldn't it be great if people were just more kind? I hope you have the Heavenly Library with you because I want you to go to 2 Samuel chapter 9 because when we go to this story, this is an incredible story about grace. But there's a word that is used over and over in the story, and it's not exactly the word grace, although grace fills every line of this incredible story. But the word that is used over and over is kindness. Follow along with me. This is 2 Samuel chapter 9, 2 Samuel chapter 9, and I'm going to begin reading now in verse 1. And David said, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul? that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan, he is crippled in his feet. I, I want to stop right there and I want you to notice a couple of things about this story. First of all, the historical setting. The king is David. Well, the text kind of gave that away. But you need to understand where we are in David's reign at this moment. This is, if you will, the infancy, the early years of his reign. And he's a young king, probably in his early 30s. He's not old by any stretch of the imagination. And he's taken a divided kingdom and he's united it. There was so much turmoil in the land of Israel in that day with the previous regime, Saul, and the turmoil that he created. But David not only united everybody together, he's defeated all their enemies. And their great enemy was the Philistines. And David has conquered them. But even more importantly, what David has done in just the early years of his reign is he's restored the nation Spiritually, the Ark of the Covenant, for the first time in a long, long time, is actually back in Jerusalem, back in Israel where it belongs. It had been in the hands of the Philistines. Well, you would think somebody who has had all this great success, his popularity is probably through the roof, his approval rating way up in the 90s plus. You would think he would be happy and content, but he's not. He's not. And so what you see David saying is, I, 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 I'm looking to keep a promise. In fact, he'll bring this up. Is there anyone, is there anyone left in the house of Saul? Now, why did he say that? Well, he had made a covenant many years earlier with a good friend of his by the name of Jonathan. Now, this is also interesting and needs to be understood. Jonathan is the son of Saul. And if anybody should be king or should have been next in line, it should have been Jonathan. But Jonathan really saw the handwriting on the wall. He knew his father was not a godly man. And he also knew that David had been anointed king. And, and when he sees the faith of David and he sees the courage of David, and you might remember after the story of David and Goliath, who was drawn to David, who immediately went up to him? Well, it was Jonathan. And they have a bond like no other. And understanding where this is headed and understanding that he's probably going to have to stand with his father and he may even probably lose his life with his father. He's going to be loyal to his father. He knows that his family may be left behind. And he says, David, do me a deal. you got to make a covenant with me. You'll take care of my family. Isn't that amazing? Can I just share with you, there's some great heroes of the Bible that maybe didn't get a lot of pages, a lot of press. But are incredible men of God. Jonathan's one of them. And his armor bearer would be another one. That's a story for another day. And so here's David. I made a promise. And so what you see David doing. 
is David saying, I need to show kindness. Now, the word kindness in the Hebrew is, is really an interesting study. You, you can look in many dictionaries, and it certainly uses mercy, grace, the way we would define it, the idea of doing a good deed. But it can also mean covenant faithfulness. Now, here's the point I really want you to see. It isn't just any covenant, and it isn't just any type of faithfulness. Notice what David said. Is there anyone to whom I may show God's kindness to? I want you to remember that. I want to show God's kindness. I, I'm not looking to just give somebody a cup of coffee. I'm not saying, hey, I rewound the tape. Oh, man, aren't I good? I, I want to give kindness. My father gives kindness. Now you'll notice in the story that the servant, Ziba, says, well, there is a guy. <laughs> there actually is a guy, but here's what you need to know, David. Uh, he's lame. He's crippled in both of his feet. Now, I don't know what you're looking for here. I, I know you're looking for something. You want to do a good deed. But really, if you're looking for somebody who's going to come serve in your cabinet or maybe serve in your army or some, serve as an advisor, he's probably not your guy. He's crippled. Now, can I stop real quick and just make a quick application? Have you ever done that to somebody or sized somebody up like that? I'll give you an example. Y'all got Carrie Keenan, right? Do you know anybody more zealous for saving souls than Carrie? Anybody know him? He's the man, isn't he? He's awesome. He and Kim, great servants. Let's say that Carrie's actually stirring everybody up here. He's saying, all right, all right, we're all going to get involved. I'm going to get you all involved. And he's preaching this long, good, wonderful sermon series. And, and every single Sunday you hear Carrie just fire you up, fire you up. And finally one Monday morning you wake up and go, I'm going to be a Carrie. Maybe not as tall as Carrie, but I'm going to be a Carrie, all right? And I'm going to go out there and save a soul. And so you wake up that next day all fired up, ready to go. And you're actually dragging your trash out. And you're on the lookout even as you go out to the curb. And here comes your neighbor coming out. And you go, oh, yes. Yes, that's my guy. Oh, I've been, oh, you know, I'm going to go talk to him. And right before you go running over there, you notice he's carrying out the recyclables. It's got a few bottles in it. Cling, cling, sets it down. And you go, mm, mm. He, he's, he's not really probably that interested. He likes to drink and other things. I mean, look for somebody else or you get to work the next day or the later in that day and you're looking around, you're kind of peeking over your cubicle and, oh, yes, her, oh, yeah. She actually quoted a verse the other day. I'm going to go talk to her and you, and you just get rid of the courage to go over there and you go, oh, whoa, wait a minute. She's, she's on like her third marriage and even that's not going well. And, and you go, no, I'm going to look for somebody else. And by the time you get home that day, you go, man, that's just, that's just so sorry. It's kind of hard that I couldn't find anybody to share the gospel with today. Maybe tomorrow will be better. Because what'd you do? You tried to determine everybody's value by what you saw on the outside. David didn't ask for a scouting report. He just said, is there anybody? Notice how the story continues. David goes, where is he? Where is he? I, I didn't ask for what's his condition. I want to know where is he? And Ziba said to the king, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and he paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, do not fear, catch this. For I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I'll restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you will eat at my table always. And Mephibosheth paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for such a dead dog as I? Wow. 
Mephibosheth, snap out of it, man. What, what's going on here? Well, shouldn't he be excited? Well, I want you to notice a couple of things, and this is pretty interesting with respect to Mephibosheth. He is certainly a man of humility. When you consider his name, <laughs> his name actually means big shame. Who names their child that? I mean, seriously. Who just has a child come into the world and goes, Oh, that's a shameful sight there. I'm going to name this kid. I've always wondered, did Nabal's parents actually name him an idiot? I mean, was he born and they went, Oh, good night. Would you look at that? That's one of the dumbest kids I've ever seen in my life. Na did they really name him Nabal? Did his mom really call him? You're just a shame. Really? I don't know if it worked that way. His father, Ishbosheth, means son of shame. Maybe he was named, I mean, his uncle's name was Ishbosheth. Maybe he was named after I don't know. I've, 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 often wondered, I've often wondered if sometimes people got their names in the biblical text, not because that was exactly the name that their mama gave them, but maybe it was something that kind of fit their life. I don't know. I'm just wondering. But he is kind of living up to his name, isn't he? He's filled with shame. When I first studied this lesson, I couldn't help but go, I wonder what my name means. I got all excited and started looking it up. Philip, it sounds Greek. It's got to be good. You know, father of Alexander. Ooh, maybe it means warrior. Yes. Conquering hero. 6'4 stud. Yes. Yeah, I got all excited. You know what it means? Lover of horses. Yeah, you laugh. You laugh. And I'll tell you what, I'm, I was really surprised when Don introduced me. He didn't introduce me like he's introduced me before. Do you know what Don said? And he did this in a lectureship once. You all know what Phil's name means, don't you? Everybody here know? It means, it means my little pony. <laughs> yeah, sweet Don, the same guy up there entertaining your kids. <laughs> my mama did not name me my little pony, I'm telling you. But his name means shame. It's quite a burden, don't you think? He's living in a land called Lodabar. Now, this is also significant with respect to names. You don't really hear much about Lodabar in Scripture. In fact, you only have it mentioned a couple of times. It's mentioned in the, in, in the Minor Prophets as a place filled with rocks. If you were to go to the back of your Bible and look at the maps and go up to the Sea of Galilee and then go east out into the desert, where it was. Lodabar means no pasture. So if it has no pasture, it has what? No herds, no flocks. In that day and age, you have no herds, no flocks, no pasture. You have what? No money, no business. It's a home for the weary, a place for the forgotten. It's a it's a refuge for those that are ready to escape. And so Mephibosheth is called to David. What does he do? Well, he falls down in worship. And he says, I'm just a dead dog. Now, I don't really need to define that for you. That's pretty universal all through the history of the, the world, hadn't it? I mean, not just a dog, a dead dog. Worthless. Disgusting. What probably was going through the mind of Mephibosheth? Anybody have an idea why he would be just so almost despondent and so humble and so scared? Anybody got an idea why he probably acted like that? Yeah. I mean, when the new king came on and it was a change and what did you usually do or usually what happened to the lineage of the previous king? Yeah. I mean, that was that life. That's why he was probably scared. I mean, David's going to bring me all the way back to Jerusalem just so he can take me out. I'm, I'm not worth the effort. 
I got nothing to offer. I got nothing for you to fear. Now, can I stop and make another application? Have you ever felt like that? You ever had that moment in your life where you were so filled with shame, so humiliated, that you felt worthless? In Ephesians chapter 2 and in verses 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul really defines all of us, doesn't he? You were dead in your trespasses and your sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom we also once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the others. Yeah. Yeah. But the story doesn't stop there. Then the king, verse 9, Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and he said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I've given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him. They shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all the Lord, my Lord, the king commands his servants, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. What do you call that? What do you call that? An act of kindness? Is that a cup of coffee? Hey, Mephibosheth, here's an extra cup of coffee. We've just got this going in line here. Enjoy you a cup. Is that, hey, Mephibosheth, we rewound the tape for you so no, you don't have to see the end of the movie. You can watch the front. Is that the way it is? No. No, this is God's kindness. It, it, this is kindness that goes to another level. This is kindness that most of the world cannot comprehend. In our world, we find it very difficult to just have simple acts, much less a big act like this. But what you find here is a kindness that is monumental, but it's the kindness of our Father. The exile is now a son. The recluse is now redeemed. The forgotten has been forgiven. Can you grasp this? I, I want to make sure you get this, all right? I want to make sure you get this. I, I want to I do a make-believe story for you, all right? Let me make this very clear from the beginning. I am making this up, okay? I am making this up. But I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine that King David, King David decides after all his great conquests and all these great victories, all this popularity, he decides to have some big royal banquet at the palace, and he invites all the dignitaries of the land to come and all the people of the who's who, the people who are it, the people that are in the know. They get their invitations and they show up and you can see them coming up in their chariots with the big Mercedes Benz on the side. Somebody comes up in their Tesla. The horses don't even walk. They just slide. <laughs> and they get out and they're dressed so nice. And they make their way into the banquet hall and the tapestries are hung. The decorations are incredible. The band is playing the most beautiful music and the feast. Oh, man, the feast is everywhere. And everybody's there that's excited. We're at the king's place. We're at the king's place. This is so cool. We're at the king's place. And then the king steps out and everybody takes their place at their seat and they stand there so excited. And David welcomes his guests. And then at his table, which is empty, he says, ladies and gentlemen, my family. Amnon comes out first. You know how old his children are. A little cocky. He goes to the head of the table. <laughs> it's like an oldest kid. Takes his place there. Tamar follows next, dressed in the fabulous Gucci of Jerusalem gown. And all the women are oohing and on, and the guys are looking, and they're getting elbows from their wives. Get your eyes back here. She takes her place. 
Absalom comes in next. Before he came in, he actually did like 50 push-ups, so the veins would be coming out of his biceps. He's got that long hair going. He comes up there and he kind of flexes as he stands. Solomon's next, and he acts like he's kind of bored. He's reading a book. Yeah, whatever. Takes his place. And you notice there's still an empty chair. And you're going, they're all there. I know the king's family. I see them in people all the time. They're all there. And the king looks a little distraught. What's he waiting on? Then in the silence, there's this. And this weak, frail boy using crutches to limp up to the table. Pulls himself up beside David and David just smiles. Puts his arms around that young man and says, ladies and gentlemen, my son, Mephibosheth. Now I made that story up. I know what you're thinking. Solomon isn't even born yet. I know, I know, I made it up. But I don't think it's too far-fetched. Because what you see in the story more than anything, and this is what David wanted to do. This was the goal. I don't want to just show kindness. My goal here isn't just to be kind. My goal here isn't just to be like any other person who you might consider to be a good person. No, I want to show God's kindness. And so what you see in David is the attitude of a merciful king and a king like no other. And what does he do? He accepts the humble regardless of their shame. Listen to what James tells us all in James 4, 6. Speaking of our Father, He gives more grace. Therefore, He says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Ephesians 2, verse 8 For by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Proverbs 22, 11 He who loves purity of heart and has grace on his lips, the king will be his friend. He is a king. And what he wants to be is like the king, his father. So what does he do? He accepts those who are filled with shame. But he doesn't stop there. He then carries it a step step further. He's going to restore honor and privilege to the one who has fallen. Notice David said, Ziba, here's the plan. You now have a new master. Remember that little kid? Remember that little kid who was running around the palace when you were here with Saul and David? Jonathan? He, he's now, he's now grown. And he's now your master. And you're going to till the land for him. And everything that belonged to his father, he gets back. And Ziba has 15, 15 sons, 20 servants. And who are they all working for now? The kid that was in Lodabar. The kid who was an orphan. The kid who once was in no pasture is now in prosperity. What does scripture tell us about our father? <laughs> Psalms 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield and the Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. 1 Peter 5, verse 10. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. And then Psalms 103. Oh, how I love Psalms 103. Every single verse is filled with the kindness of God. Here's what, it, here's what the psalmist says in verses 2 and 4. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities and redeems your life from destruction and catch this and crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. That phrase loving kindness is seen all through the Old Testament. Jacob, Jacob will praise God for his kindness. Joseph will receive kindness even when he's thrown into a prison that God is looking after him. Moses will sing of the loving kindness of God in Exodus. Naomi will speak to Ruth about the kindness of God and how he blesses the living and the dead. David will sing how his soul thirsts for God and he longs for God's kindness all the more throughout the Psalms. And then we get to the New Testament. And what are we told? What are we shared with by the words of Paul through Titus? That our loving Father shows His kindness through Jesus. 
Christ our Lord. But the father doesn't stop there and neither does David. For David isn't just going to accept and restore. He's going to treat the lame as family. To treat the lame as family. In Romans chapter 8 and verses 14 to 17, here's what the Apostle Paul says to all of us about our Father's kindness. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. If children, then heirs. Heirs of God. And joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. The World War II generation. Can we all agree that's the greatest generation? For many of us, yeah. Great generation. There's actually a book that was written called Project Roots, and it was about children who were born during World War II. And many of them that were born in Europe were orphaned, born to GIs, born to servicemen from overseas, and the mothers were left with them, unable to take care of them, and so many of them were left at fire stations, police departments, or other places. And so the book takes some of these children, and it gets the word out to somebody who may be able to look at them now and maybe try to find who their parents were. Obviously, by the time the book was written, which was about 15 years ago, Clearly, their parents are no longer going to be here, but maybe they could just find the lineage. So there was always that hope, always that desire, always that longing for them to find out who was really their dad or their mom. The fact of the matter is, we know most of them would never know. But can I remind us all of this? If you're a child of God, if you're a Christian, you know. You know. I'm not really Jill and Gray's dad. Now, there is a joke with the Hammond trees. My daughter lived so much with them that they were her real parents. I was just the biological parent, but she chose them. And, you know, she wanted, and I don't blame her for that. She did well, all right? But really, Jill and Gray, they're really not even mine. I was just a blessed steward, given a wonderful blessing to take care of them. But who's their real father? Well, God. God. I think that's something we don't really just take the time to soak in enough. We're not orphans. We haven't been abandoned. And I want you to know that your heavenly father doesn't just want to forgive you. That's where it begins, his grace. He doesn't want to just give you a hope of heaven. That's certainly the continuum of grace. But he says, I want you to live with me forever in my house forever. What did Jesus say over and over again every single time he prayed? What was he saying? My father. My father. And our father is filled with grace and kindness. 
All right, let's wrap this up with just a few applications, all right? This is certainly a story of grace. It's a story that shares with us the wonderful grace of our Father. And I know the word grace isn't exactly in the text, but I think you can see and understand that it's in there. It's in there. It's in there. And it's God's kindness. And, and I want to be a person who not only understands that kindness, I want to be able to share it with others. So where do I begin? Well, I need to be reminded of this. Grace reminds all of us that we are lame for all of sin, all of fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, that woman that was caught in adultery, why did Jesus have so much compassion for her when nobody else did? Because our Lord was filled with kindness. He didn't see an adulteress. He saw an opportunity. And more importantly, when you go to John chapter 8 and you read that story, the very next verse after the story, and I just hope she was there to hear the sermon that Jesus preached because Jesus talked about being a light in the world. And if you follow me, you will no longer be in darkness, but you will become a light. You're not just somebody who was a sinner. You are now mine, and I am giving you the opportunity to now represent me to this world. And all of our Lord's lights at one time had been burned out and filled with sin. Everyone. Everyone. I don't want to knock on your preachers or your elders, but they're sinners too. They're not continuing in sin. They're men of God. They're wives or women of God. But they're not in those positions because they're perfect. They're your leaders and they're your shepherds because they understand the grace of our Lord. And the church is not a hotel, folks. It's not a place for us to come in and say, well, I sure hope the temperature's right today and I sure hope the sermon is very edifying and the singing better be very good today and could I have a little mint on my pew so I'm just very satisfied here and somebody better come and talk to me real quick because... <laughs> The friendliness of this congregation is questionable. It's not a hotel. It's a hospital. And all of us need the care and the attention of the great physician. And when you have the blessed opportunity to come into a wonderful family like this, you don't come in to sit. You come in to serve. Sure, some of us may just be straight from the ER. Our life has been really challenging and we need a lot of attention. But Lord willing, you're going to continue to progress to a step-down unit. And then eventually you'll go to ICU. And then eventually you can go to the, one of the floors. And then eventually you can be one of those patients that walks around, look, checking in on everybody with your pole and just seeing how everybody else is doing. But you don't leave the hospital. Because grace reminds me, I need it. I want it. And so secondly, what is grace? Well, grace can be multiplied. Uh, <laughs> just out of curiosity, anybody here have an obnoxious sibling? Anybody grow up with one of those? Were they younger? They were younger? Most of them younger? Yeah, I had one of those. My brother Todd, two years younger than me. By the time I was four, he was two. He was already taller than me. I'm the only kid growing up to get hand-me-ups instead of hand-me-downs. <laughs> Punk. Gets worse. He was obnoxiously nice. Remember one Christmas, I was about 15. My brother was 13. My dad was opening the gift that Todd gave him, and it was a massive gift. And I thought, oh, this is one of those clown gifts where it's going to be open this package. It's going to be another box of this, you know, and it's going to be something real small like a tie. That's what you're supposed to get your dad. I, mean, I remember my dad opened the very first box and went, oh, Todd. And he pulled out a brand new set of golf clubs. I grabbed Todd. I yanked him in the dining room. And I said, what are you doing? Where are the kids? They're the adults. They get us the golf clubs. What are you going to do next year? You thought about that? Come on, man. About 17 years ago, he was getting married. He called the house and he was all excited because he and Laura decided they were going to get married and we were really excited for him. I was, and he goes, man, it's going to be great. I'll talk, this is great. We're real great. Where are you getting married? He went, Hawaii. And I went, have fun. He goes, no, I want you to perform the ceremony. And I went, 
oh. I'm thinking, do I have to take Cheryl? Because if I take Cheryl and then my kids, that's going to be like $20,000. If I can leave a couple of kids, I'm saying, oh, am I going to pay for this? And, and then Todd goes, and I'm flying you all out there. I'm paying for everything. Todd. <laughs> yes. Yes. Kindness. You know how kindness feels? You do, don't you? I think it's time for Todd and Laura to renew their vows. Can we all agree on that? But the more you give it, the more it grows. It's not like money that once it's given away, it's gone. You can give away all you want and it's never going to end. Because that's how grace works. And people that appreciate grace, give grace. Give forgiveness, give hope, give joy. Don't think that it's always easy, but it is always rewarding. Thirdly, what you find with grace, oops, sorry. Can I just share with you that grace is the first step of salvation? It's the first step. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Then mercy. Then Jesus. Then the word. And I bet you know the rest of them. Share it. Share it. Don't keep it in your pocket. Share it. Grace is more than just salvation. In a moment, all these little kids are going to come running in here. Every little hug, every little smile is grace. That's God's kindness. And that cup overflows, doesn't it? All these people, all your brothers and sisters, it's grace. God hadn't left you alone. And he stirs us each day. And ultimately, can I remind us of this? Because three times in the story, this is what David says. Mephibosheth, you're at my table. Mephibosheth, he'll be at my table. Mephibosheth, you're right here. The love and kindness and grace of our Lord is knowing that you're loved. And you have a seat at the table. Thank you all so very much for your kind attention.